MCC. We're so excited to have you here with us. We got a whole lot to praise. We got a whole lot to celebrate together. Let's sing praise. I'll praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign together. So one, two, three. I'll praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise because you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise because you're faithful. Praise because you're true. Praise because there's nobody greater than you. Let's go. I'll praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise because you rose and defeated the grave. Praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. So praise the Lord, oh my soul.
to that. Hey, we're human beings too, right? Things happen. This morning, hey, we've got some baptisms that are be going on to my right over here during this next song, and we want to keep the praise going. We want to keep the celebration going. We believe that baptism is an outward expression of an inward change, and we want to clap. We want to cheer. We want to make it loud as these people make this public declaration of taking their next steps with Jesus Christ. So we sing this together. Beautiful. 
we worship you this morning, knowing that your name is above every other. Our, we praise you, Lord, and we thank you for everything that you give us in our lives. In your name we pray, amen. Before you go ahead and take your seat, go ahead and take 30 seconds and say hello to your neighbor. Good morning, good to see you all. Hey, if you could, if you're on the edge of a row, if you could scoot in and take over some of the chairs next to you, make a little extra room for folks that are still coming in, that would be awesome. Hey, if we haven't met before, my name is Mike. I'm the campus pastor here in Draper, and this is Micaiah. She teaches women's Bible good study morning. on Thursday nights at 6.30. Always looking for more people. It's good to see you. Hey, if you are new with us today or relatively sometime in the last few weeks you've started coming here, we would love to get to know you more. And one of the best ways for that to happen is if you fill out a connection card. You can find those in the seat back pocket of the chair in front of you. There are some circles there with some words next to them. You could check any circle that you want to. If you want more information about baptism, for instance, if you're like, huh, what was that all about? We would love to talk to you about that. Or maybe you think that's your next step and uh, we'd like to put you in the queue to get that done. Absolutely. So mark anything that's appropriate and uh, we'd love to start a, a dialogue, find out a little bit more about you. You can leave those cards at the Next Steps counter or over with me at the New Here table at the end of church today. Totally. And for anyone who hasn't noticed, it is officially fall. I started celebrating it in September, because I can. But it is officially fall, which means it's my favorite event, which is Trunk or Treat. Um, SMCC has put, been putting this on for several years, and it's genuinely one of my favorite events that we do. I don't have any kids, but I totally enjoy putting on a trunk, decorating my car, and just seeing all the fun costumes. I heard a rumor that there may be some reptile friends there. There are reptiles, yes. A uh, pie contest. So one thing, though, that we need is lots of volunteers to make this event happen. This is one of the first ways people discover SMCC. So we need lots of volunteers, whether it's you baking a pie, hosting a trunk, and or even just serving, or you can donate candy, which we also need a lot of. There's a bin right outside of the bookstore, and there's the QR code that's also behind us if you want to do more. Absolutely. You can volunteer. You can host a trunk. You can also be part of the pie baking contest. There's another QR code out in the lobby for that. All sorts of things going on at that event. Well, we're also uh, hosting a marriage conference coming up soon. It's for married couples and singles. Anybody in a significant relationship or planning to get married someday, we're excited to host this. It's from the Allender Center. They're very well known for their focus on marriage. I want to read the verbiage from the registration page for our event. They say... Uh, let's see, where is it? Here is what they say about it. More than just a conference, this is an experience where you move beyond techniques and how-tos to deepen your understanding of your, of your stories and begin to create a stronger marriage marked by kindness, care, and courage. In this two-day conference, you will be invited into a place of newfound awareness and ability to engage conflict and desire. As, um, as individuals and as a couple. So $200 per couple with an early bird special for anyone registering before November 1st. There's the inclusion of a little micro uh, video conference that you get, which is another $200 value. You can scan the QR on there or go out to the next steps counter. There's a TV there that will also have that same slide. And there's also some folks out there who've been to this conference, are huge fans, and they would love to tell you anything that you need to know about it and answer all your questions. So helpful. Um, I know I just mentioned fall, but we're gonna blink. It's gonna be Christmas, and then it's gonna be January. 
promise. It's gonna happen so fast. And in January 17th through the 20th, we've got something for our high school students called Winter Camp, my second favorite, maybe first. <laughs> it's competing. Um, this happens at Big Canyon Ranch. It's an incredible campsite um, where they get to do lots of fun activities together, learn more about God, and also grow those friendships that are happening here at SMCC. The theme this year is Twisters, not to be confused with the movie that just came out. This is gonna be about how uh, God helps us when life feels out of control. Um, it's never too early to sign up, so if you have a kid or a friend that is in high school, go ahead and start getting signed up and mark it in your calendars. Awesome, well, that's what we have for you this morning. We're gonna invite Ren up to give us sermon number two in our study of First Thessalonians. Awesome, thank you, Mike, thank you, Micaiah. Morning. Wow, that's encouraging. Really good to see everyone's faces. Uh, my name is Ren, in case we haven't met. In fact, if we haven't met, I'm gonna be at the new here table afterwards. Just come say hi, shake my hand. I have the privilege of serving on the teaching team here at SMCC. Uh, it's really an honor to be with everybody this morning. And if I'm honest, it's also a little surprising because to me, it doesn't feel like it was all that long ago that I first walked through that door when I first came to SMCC. Some of you might know exactly what I'm talking about. When I walked in, I had no idea what to expect because I'd never been a part of a church like this. You might wonder, what do you mean a church like this? Well, a church that is part of the true body of Christ. Thing is, back then, I don't think I would have understood what that even meant. I was so new, to say that I was brand new, I think kind of overstates how young in faith I really was. Because when I walked through those doors, spiritually, I didn't have anything to offer. You know, I didn't have this experience in the Christian life. I didn't, I didn't know the Bible. I didn't have this deep well of spiritual wisdom to offer to people. I was just brand new. Now God had planted something in me but it was gonna be some time before there was anything to harvest from it. But still, when I look back on that time in my life, I'm amazed by the love and the support and the grace that so many people showed me, believers that were much more mature than I was. And many of them are here right now. Even though I, I didn't have anything really to offer, I didn't have much to give, there were so many people that just gave and gave of themselves, expecting nothing in return. And that's really true with so much of our spiritual lives. They were crucial for my spiritual growth. And I'd like to ask, when you think back, no matter where you are in your walk, when you think back, who has shown concern for your spiritual growth? And how did they show it? especially if you've been a follower of Jesus for quite some time, think back to when you were a new believer and who took an interest in you and really took an interest in your faith? What did it do to you? How did it change you? One of the truths about being a follower of Jesus is that no matter where we are in our walk now, whether you've been a follower of Jesus for decades or whether, well, if you, if you just got baptized five minutes ago, one of the things that's true of our life is that none of us mature in faith without receiving the love and the encouragement of other believers who are more mature than us. It's part of how we come to understand who Jesus is because having people around us who are more developed in their faith is what helps us develop our faith. Well, last week, Eric talked about one of the things that helps build our confidence in Jesus. And he talked about celebration. Celebrating who Jesus is, rejoicing in him, helps build our confidence in him. Well, today I'd like to talk about two other elements. And the first is concern. How we show concern for one another's faith and spiritual growth. But also the, the context in which we do that is equally important. So the second is connection. In other words, being part of a community of believers. So welcome to the second part of our series called With Confidence, where we're taking a deep dive into Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. And in this second part, in chapter two, we're gonna see that in this 2,000-year-old letter, 
written in another language, uh, written on another continent, written to a culture that was vastly different than ours. But what it, mean, what it means to be a fully developed believer, even way back then, was the same as it is now. Now, even if you've been with SMCC for only a short while, you've undoubtedly heard a lot about maturity. That is one of our key values here. It's how we define maturity. And it simply refers to the truth that our lives in Jesus grow and develop over time. Like there's a reason that Jesus in so many of his parables, when he talks about the nature of faith, is using analogies to seeds and plants and fruit. But it's also true that in our walk, we're inevitably going to encounter people who have what we might call selective maturity. And often this might describe us ourselves. But where we are developing well in some areas, but we're still lacking in others. We're still immature in other areas of growth. For example, uh, we might encounter people who know the Bible extremely well. Right? They have this deep theological understanding. But they're still lacking maturity when it comes to healthy relationships, especially good spiritual relationships. Or maybe somebody is really gifted in serving but they're still uninformed about the Bible and, and perhaps even core aspects of the gospel. Maybe somebody has deep uh, emotional wisdom with relationships, but they're still lacking when it comes to sacrificing and serving others. So to understand what true maturity looks like in the Christian life then, we need a blueprint for growth. So here it is. A blueprint for spiritual growth is that Jesus equips us three ways, in our head, in our heart, and our hands. Now, some of you are thinking, yeah, I've noticed that's a pretty prominent theme around SMCC, but what exactly do you mean by that? Well, we can break it down this way. Being equipped in our head refers to biblical and theological maturity. And here we don't just mean like textbook knowledge about the Bible. There's a lot of really good scholars that have great textbook knowledge about the Bible. We mean, is our life built on a solid foundation of understanding the gospel? Does biblical knowledge and wisdom guide how we live? Being equipped in our heart is emotional and relational maturity. Above all, do we love and forgive the way that Jesus does? Do we know how to cultivate healthy relationships in our lives? And I'll tell you just as a personal note, when I think about people who don't know Jesus yet, when they look at me, if they were to ask themselves, if there were a, a church or a community of believers that were full of people just like Wren, would they want to be a part of it? Would they find it attractive? And sometimes that can be a really rough reality check. But it tells me how well I am reflecting who Jesus is with other people. And then lastly, being equipped in our hands is serving maturity. Are we fueled by a desire to serve other people? Is it something that we're actually eager to do rather than just doing it out of duty or obligation? Now, one of the things that I think, anytime we talk about growth and development, just part of American culture, I think we have this way of thinking that we should be on a path that has consistent and constant growth. Right, where every day we wake up a little bit more mature than we were the day before. Has anyone been on a growth path like that? For how long? Usually it doesn't last very long. You know, it's like usually you're going, to, you're going to reach periods of difficulty. You're going to reach periods of stagnation. Sometimes you're going to reach a point, especially in our spiritual walk, where we just feel stuck. Now this can look uh, several different ways. Uh, maybe it's just the fact where it feels like our growth has stagnated. Especially if sometime in your past, you had a drastic conversion experience or you had a period in your life where you were just spiritually on fire. Maybe it's a, a situation where you find that you're falling back into sin or other worldly things that you previously had left behind. But maybe it reaches a point where it's like a full-blown faith crisis 
where all of a sudden you're wrestling with foundational aspects of your faith and you find it difficult to even do the basics. And when we're in that situation, there's a number of questions that we might find ourselves asking. Like what happened to that remarkable growth that I once had? Why, you know, when I, I had this period of being spiritually on fire, what happened to it? Why does it feel like the fire's gone out? Or maybe you were even asking, is something wrong with my relationship with God? Has something been jeopardized? Now, personally, I found that these types of episodes are a lot more common than we often admit because people find it difficult to open up when they're going through something like that. Maybe they're worried about being judged. They're not sure how to talk about it. Uh, they wanna be encouraging and they don't feel like they have a lot of encouragement to offer. But when we're in that episode of feeling like our confidence has been shaken, we need something to help us. Right? We need, when we're stuck, we need a blueprint that clarifies the way forward. And what we'll see is that this blueprint was actually laid out from the very beginnings of the church. So dive in with me to the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians, and we're gonna see how Paul begins to outline this blueprint for growth. So we're gonna start with verses one through six. All right, so Paul says, you know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you is not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. All right, so let's park here for a minute. And what I wanna note with you is two things that Paul talks about. And then I wanna ask you a question in connection with both of them. So the first is, Paul talks about his desire to share the gospel in spite of his sufferings. So he talks about how they had been treated in Philippi. Philippi was the city that Paul and his companions had been in prior to coming to Thessalonica. And what had happened there is Paul had actually cast out a spirit of divination from the slave girl. Well, the people who owned the slave girl, this was their source of income. And being really angry about it, they take Paul, his companions, they take him into the marketplace, this mob forms, they rip off their clothes, they're beating them with rods, and then they're taken before the magistrates. They're put into prison, and their feet are actually put in these stocks to top it all off. You think about these medieval stocks where they put your feet in there so you can't move. They're specifically designed to humiliate a person. And having gone through all this, they actually find out the next day that they had committed a really serious offense against Paul because Paul was a Roman citizen. But they make their way to Thessalonica and Paul is saying that by God's grace, in spite of all of this, they still had the desire to share the gospel and nothing hindered them. And this is what I wanna note. Those times in my life, I've never been through anything like what Paul's been through, not even close. But those times in my life where I've gone through suffering, I will confess that the first thing on my mind is not how can I go serve more people? For me, suffering tends to turn me inward. I, I have a tendency to isolate. And this is what, you know, physical pain, spiritual pain, any kind of pain exacerbates our needs. And we understand this because it's part of the reason that we like to come together and help those who are going through suffering or hardship. We don't expect people who are suffering to come minister to us. But with Paul, we see something very different. In spite of all of his suffering, Paul doesn't retreat. He doesn't turn inward. In fact, if anything, all of this affliction only emboldens him to want to go share the gospel more. So the question I want to ask is, where does this kind of desire, this kind of endurance come from? Because it certainly isn't coming from Paul himself. So keep that question in your mind. The second thing to note about what Paul says is the purity of their motives. So we didn't have any desire to deceive you. We, didn't, we weren't seeking any financial gain. 
But he also notes that there was no desire to please them or to seek praise from them. Now, why do you think Paul says that? Why does he have no desire to please them? Well, if you think about it, the more that you love somebody, truly love somebody, the more you want to serve them instead of please them. In fact, the more that we try to please people, and especially when we try to seek praise from people, it actually erodes our love for them. Sometimes it can cause a lot of bitterness and resentment towards the very people that we're trying to please or get praise from. But with Paul, he, is, he has so much love for this church that that's why he has no desire to please them. His only desire is to please God. So he doesn't want to please them, he wants to serve them. Where does that desire come from? All right, so keep those questions in mind. Let's keep reading. So in verses seven through 12, Paul says, instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Now, did you note know the three things to which Paul compared himself? He says that they were like young children, like a nursing mother, and like a father. That's interesting. How, how can you be all of those things at the same time? How can you be like young children, a mother, and a father? Well, Paul talks about being young children in that they were gentle and innocent. In fact, the Greek word that he uses there can be used as infants. But then right away, he says they were also like a nursing mother. What's that like? Well, I don't know. But you get the sense Paul's talking about, you know, someone who is so willing to give of her very life, to sacrifice of herself for the care of her children. And that's how Paul feels towards this church. But then he also says he was like a father, encouraging, comforting. You get the sense that Paul feels as protective of this church as a father would over his own children. Well, why is Paul using all of this imagery of family? I think because that's exactly what this church is to him. It's his family. And he's using all of this family imagery to describe the different ways that we love. This is true love that Paul has for the church. So again, similar question, but where does that kind of love come from? So with all those questions in mind, let's look at what the Apostle John says. Apostle John, he's often known as the Apostle of Love. Let's see what he has to say about where this comes from. So in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, he says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now we can ask, why is this part of Paul's letter still preserved for us? I know sometimes we take for granted all these parts of the New Testament that we have, but for us to have it, what the church at Thessalonica had to do, they deemed it important enough to take Paul's letter, make copy after copy after copy, and send all these copies throughout the other churches in the Greco-Roman world. They were doing this for hundreds of years. But why did they keep this part? Was it just for the theological substance that comes in the later chapters, but you can't keep those later chapters without keeping the introductory chapters and drag them along with it? Or is there more to it? Is there any substance to all this relational stuff that Paul's talking about? Well, the truth is all this relational stuff is the heart and soul of the gospel. Because experiencing the gospel is just as important as understanding it. 
And we can only experience the gospel in the context of relationships. It requires community. For example, I can tell you all day until I'm blue in the face that God knows absolutely everything about you. He knows everything you have done, everything you will do. He knows all the things that no one else on earth knows about. Even the things you're terrified of being found out, God knows. And still, he loves you more than you can possibly imagine. Jesus gave himself on the cross knowing exactly who you are. In fact, the reason that Jesus died for you is because he knows exactly who you are. Now, you can understand that intellectually, but most of the time, that's still not enough to get you out of hiding, to get those things that have been in the darkness into the light. It's still not enough to heal some of the deepest wounds that you have. Because to get there, you can't just understand it intellectually. You have to experience it which means allowing somebody to know you as fully and completely as possible and then to love you and accept you and embrace you on the other side. And when that happens, when you experience that for the first time in your life, it changes you. And that's why Paul labored so much to not just preach the gospel to the Thessalonians, but to actually impart an experience of the gospel. That's why he loves these people so much, because they had experienced the love of God together. That's why they're his family. So let's keep reading what Paul says. So we're gonna go to verses 13 through 16. He says, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is. The word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same thing those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Now, I want to keep this passage up on the screen for a minute because I want to pay attention to what Paul says specifically in verse 13. So he tells the Thessalonians, you accepted the word of God as it really is, and it was the word of God that is at work in you who believed. But even after we've believed, even after we are in Christ, very often we encounter a temptation to fall back into a religious way of thinking, where in essence what we do is we reverse that. Rather than us accepting and God's word working in us, we think, no, I've got to do the work of changing who I am on the inside and the outside, and then if I do enough work, God will accept me. But that just isn't the gospel. Remember, when we have believed and accepted Jesus, we are not only accepted by God, we are in Christ. And if we're in Christ, then we're united to God because Jesus and his Father are one. Paul says that it's God's word that's at work in them. Well, what is that? Maybe a better question is, who is that? We know God's word is Jesus. It's Jesus who's at work in us. And Jesus does in us what we can never do in ourselves. I can try to change myself over and over and over again and have maybe some marginal success, but at the end of the day, it's still me trying to change me. But with Jesus in me, he can do things that's impossible for me. The way that the Apostle Peter describes it in his second epistle, he says, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Do you know what Peter said? How much are we given for a godly life? Most of what we need and then we fill up the rest? No, we're given everything we need. By our power? No, by God's power. 
being given everything we need for a godly life is just as much of a gift as salvation is. So when you are stuck, remember that the person who saved you is the same person who grows you. We weren't saved by God's grace only for us to go back to religion to try to stay in God's grace. Jesus is the one who saves us. He's also the one who keeps us. Like he said, nothing can pluck us out of his hand. So when you're stuck, remember that believing the gospel is just as important to keep growing as it was when we first accepted it. In other words, understanding the gospel is still vital. Trusting in Jesus to transform us just as we trusted in Jesus to save us. All right, so let's finish up the last few verses, what Paul says to the Thessalonians, at least in this chapter. So he says in verses 17 through 20, but brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Now, this intense longing that Paul has to see the church, it's not like taking a three or four hour road trip to go see some friends. Paul is often traveling hundreds and hundreds of miles, if not thousands of miles between these churches. And he's not exactly flying first class. A lot of this is on foot. But you get the sense that like, Paul feels the same way that a mother or father would feel being separated from their children. That's why he uses that word being orphaned from them. He's separated from his family. But he also says he has hope in them. They are going to be what he is proud to present to the Lord Jesus when he comes. Those of you who are mothers and fathers, think back to a time like when you had young children. If you ever observed your son or daughter just pouring themselves into making something, some kind of gift that was purely to make you happy, how did it make you feel? I think this is the kind of relationship that Paul is talking about, where this little church, this little flock in a very, very pagan city, it's like this beautiful gift that he wants to present to Jesus when he comes. Why? Because he knows how much Jesus delights in them. So we know that we are believing the gospel when the gospel produces in us a desire to serve others. Now, what if you find that that desire just isn't there? Or maybe you find that the desire used to be there, but it's diminishing. Well, the way that a lot of us try to handle that is we try to get busy generating those desires, trying to change something in our hearts. But we just talked about how understanding the gospel is vital. That we accept God's word and that it's God's word that works in us. It's just naturally part of the fruit that God's word bears. So if you find that this desire is lacking, examine and see if there are still areas where you haven't fully believed the gospel. Or maybe there's areas where you've accepted lies in place of the gospel. Sometimes it can also just be a matter of taking a step in faith. All of the apostles who were fishermen, you know, Peter, Andrew, James, John, they couldn't experience who Jesus was until they were willing to get out of their boats when Jesus came and said, follow me. And serving is much the same way. Sometimes it's just a matter of being willing to leave our boats. So our key truth today is that Jesus invites us to understand, to experience, and to serve in response to the gospel. There were countless people who poured into my growth and my faith when I was new and who still do. Thing is, most of them probably have no idea how important they were. Most of them probably have no idea how grateful I am. But this is why it's so important to serve because it opens up opportunities for other people to experience and to understand the gospel. God used those people who poured into my life in ways they will probably never see. 
And same with us, when we, even when we do very small things to serve, God will use that in ways that you'll never see for blessing other people. And it's also how we image Christ to one another, doing for others what others have done for us. So if you've been at that place where you felt stuck, or if you're in that place now, hopefully this has provided some clarity. Because all of our next step opportunities at SMCC are structured around these three things, being equipped in our head, our heart, and our hands. So we have SMCCU, where all of our classes are designed to help mature us in biblical and theological understanding. We have our community groups, which are for experiencing the gospel in real relationships where we live the gospel in real life with one another. And we have our serving teams where there's so many opportunities uh, for Jesus to use us and, and mature us in our hands. Now, I realize that whenever we talk about personal development, there's this temptation to think kind of how the world thinks about development. I think we're all aware of it. The way the world sees development is uh, leverage your strengths, right? Figure out what your strengths are and use them to their maximum potential. Your weaknesses, well, we either hide those or we're gonna work really hard to try to improve them. So your strengths are assets, your weaknesses are liabilities. That's how the world sees development. But that's not how things work in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, your weaknesses are not liabilities. Your weaknesses are the very place where God's grace is made manifest. Your weaknesses are where God's power is made perfect. So when we're in the world, we try to hide or deny our weaknesses. A lot of times our weaknesses are a source of shame. But when we're in Christ, then like what Paul says, we can be content with our weaknesses. Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So my invitation, when you're thinking about what's your appropriate next step, don't steer away from where you feel weak. That's precisely the place to trust in God's grace. Trust that it isn't you that will be doing all the work. Trust that that's exactly where God likes to show his power. So our bottom line today is that Jesus is restoring the image of God in you. And that includes equipping you and maturing you in your head, your heart, and your hands. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the miraculous ways that you work in our lives through one another. Um, We thank you that we can see you in other believers through your love, giving us the blessings that you've given us to understand who you are. And Lord, we pray, especially for those who are in a period right now where they're feeling stuck. We ask that they will believe more in what you've said and trust that it's you who work in them. And we pray, especially over this body, that we will follow the same blueprint that you've given us from the very beginning. And we say this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, would you please stand? Let's worship together. Sorry. <laughs> We're creation, suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. And from no South and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. We're the whole earth. We're the whole earth, echoing His evidence. His name would burst from sea and sky. From
every creature when every creature finds its inmost melody and every sing this bridge out together. Sing, I won't bow to idols. We're going to put Christ first. Magnify Him. Sing, I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true and if the cross brings transformation and you can hang me there with you cause death is just a doorway to resurrection life if I join you Just a quick reminder to sign up to do a trunk if you haven't already. And uh, there's lots of other things out there to like the pies. You could sign up to make a pie. And uh, the marriage conference material is out there as well. We're praying tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. If anybody would like to meet us down here, have a, rest, a great rest of your Sunday, everybody.